classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 14, Probe Diffusion. I'm Professor Phillies, and this is Lecture 14 of my discussion on polymer solution dynamics. Today we'll start the discussion of probe diffusion. The literature on probe diffusion is extremely large. In fact, it's, for solutions, at least as large as any of the other literatures on any of the other experimental techniques that we're going to discuss. However, if you do a search of reviews on polymer solution properties, you'll find that probe diffusion, for various historical reasons, is rather underrepresented. What is the general idea here? We have a polymer solution. We have bunches of polymer chains, and we confront them with a mesoscopic probe object, and the mesoscopic probe object sphere is simply representative, is rigid. It can't change shape. It can't change size. It just sits there and is the object it is. Now, in a sense, we've already discussed probe diffusion a bit, because the smallest probes that one can easily imagine thinking of are ions. Solvent molecules. And if you go back to our first chapter on small molecule diffusion, there are ions and solvent molecules moving through polymer solutions. We're going to be focusing here on somewhat larger particles. Now, why would, this, why would probe diffusion be an interesting technique? What does it link between? On one hand, something that we, have, we talked about in the last chapter, we have tracer and self-diffusion, in which the probe object is a random coil polymer, just like the matrix polymers are. On the other hand, this is a future chapter, we could imagine the same probe particles, except the probe particles are diffusing through a colloid solution. In all three cases, the basic forces involved are the same. You have excluded volume forces, that is, we have macromolecules that cannot move through each other, and you have hydrodynamic interactions. Between the excluded volume and the hydrodynamic interactions, there are also some short-range forces. For example, between any two material objects, you have van der Waals forces. It could be the case, we don't discuss this, that the objects are charged, in which case we have polyelectrolytes we have charged probes, and we would then have, in addition, electrostatic forces. That would get rather complicated now, wouldn't it? However, the core issues are, the core forces are excluded volume and hydrodynamic. The two forces are modulated by the shape of the matrix objects and the probes. That is, we have here a long random coil probe. We have here sphere probes. We have here random coil matrices. We have here sphere matrices. Of course, colloids don't have to be spheres, but we'll talk mostly about spheres. And therefore, we can sort out the effects due to the topology, the shapedness of the, polym of the matrix by comparing one and two and three. Recent experiments have actually demonstrated the utility of this. We'll get to this in a future lecture. The core issue in the recent experiments is that if you take a solution of random coil polymers and are a very clever chemist, you can persuade the polymers to start cross-linking with each other, that is to form permanent covalent bonds that link them together. When you do this, the random coil polymer solution is transformed into a gel, 
And the true gel, the cro chemically cross-linked gel, can then be confronted with a random coil probe or a sphere probe. These experiments clearly demonstrate that permanently cross-linked gels are entirely different physically from random coil polymer solutions. Namely, in a random coil polymer solution, fairly large spheres and random coil pro probes are equally free to move. However, if you insert the cross-links, it's a wonderful chemical trick, if you insert the cross-links, the spheres are trapped. They can't find any holes big enough to move. The polymer coils are free to move head or tail first through the holes in the polymer mesh. And therefore we can say with considerable certainty that random coil polymer solutions are not like gels and sphere probes and random coil probes can give you different sorts of information. Conclusive transparent demonstration. So we're going to be talking about probe diffusion. There is a very large literature. The large literature can be broken into three major segments. The three segments are optical probe diffusion, in which we have the probe. The classical probes are polystyrene spheres and silica spheres. We have a solution, and we use one of the standard optical methods quasi-elastic light scattering, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, forced Rayleigh scattering, uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. We use any of several methods to measure the diffusion of the probe through the matrix. A second method is particle tracking. The notion in particle tracking is that we look in with a microscope, we look in at a piece of solution, and we have done something clever to make the probes visible. For example, we could arrange things so that they're fluorescent and we're side illuminating with a dark background. We could arrange things that there's something that is highly reflective, in which case the old ultra microscope technique we illuminate from the side, the background is black, and you can easily see objects that are much smaller than the microscope's ability to resolve the shape. In either case, what you do in particle tracking is you do a video of the, par of the objects moving, and you record the position of the objects that you're interested in as a function of time. You can then go in and compute statistics of the measurements of the path. Now, the virtue of this technique is that you are actually seeing the full information on how the particle is moving. Here you're seeing something that is, for example, a statistical average of a single wavelength fluctuation relaxing. The limitation on particle tracking is that you're doing video measurements and you're limited by the frame rate of your video system. Now, technology keeps advancing and there are a variety of tricks. However, here you are certainly talking, at least at the time I speak, for the most part of times longer than a millisecond. On the other hand, with quasi-elastic light scattering, it's trivial to get down to the microsecond time scale, and there are several tricks involving the use of multiple photomultiplier tubes and such not, and cross-correlating light scattered in a single direction, but into two phototubes. Uh, you can easily get down to, oh, 50 nanoseconds. I've done it myself. So you have several different techniques. Piled on top of this, there is a separate literature which goes under the cognomen microreology. Uh, the microreology literature in part uses several other physical methods 
for example, the so-called diffusing wave spectroscopy technique, which we go over in some detail in the book. Uh, the microreology technique also refers to people who assert that since that x of t squared average is two some time dependent diffusion coefficient t and therefore from d of t we can infer it is claimed something that is now time dependent instead of a simple viscosity r and of course the time dependent viscosity really turns into the dynamic moduli um, the microreology literature is less technique focused than it's focused on the idea that by doing quasi elastic light scattering or particle tracking or some other thing you can measure the dynamic moduli, the viscoelastic properties of the medium. We'll discuss this in some detail. There are some interesting issues that these claims raise. Okay, so that's the different methods. The method that was actually introduced first into the literature was particle tracking. Because Brown, when he discovered Brownian motion, had a microscope, he did observations, and he was actually doing particle tracking, one particle at a time, observing with the naked eye. Brown was an extremely good microscopist. You can find recent papers where people duplicated period instruments, tried to duplicate his measurements, and discovered it was astonishingly difficult to get things to work. Brown had a bit more time on his hands, and he was apparently very good because he got the expected results. Okay, for optical probe diffusion, well, I remember trying with Paul Doherty, this goes back to about 73, an optical probe diffusion experiment. We took a solution of bovine serum albumin, and the idea was we would measure the viscosity of the solution by dropping in polystyrene spheres and measuring their diffusion coefficient. It was a very simple conception. Um, BSA is charged. Polystyrene spheres are charged. The polystyrene spheres went into the solution, looked around, not for very long, and aggregated and fell straight out of solution. In fact, they just fell straight to the bottom as if they were a big rock. Um, the first people who were actually smart enough to get the experiment to work wasn't it wasn't me, it was Turner and Hallett. And in 1974, uh, Hallett and several of his collab students, Turner and Gray also, uh, did experiments where they studied the diffusion of probe particles of different sorts in polymer solutions, and they successfully got measurements to work. We're going to be focusing on probe, optical probe diffusion, at least at first, so let us look at things. Um, oh, minor aside, if you are doing a literature search, there is an optical probe diffusion literature, probe diffusion literature. There is a microreology literature, especially a diffusing wave spectroscopy literature. They're substantially non-communicating. Uh, so that if you simply look in one, and the footnotes in one, and the citation searches on one, and you try to find the other um, group of papers, you're going to find it's a little more challenging than you might innocently have expected, because the two literatures don't overlap very well. Um, if you're interested in sociology of science, you can try speculating why. I'm simply pointing out that there's this very limited communication. Okay, so let us consider probe diffusion. And so here we have polymer solution, and I will simply say C B polymer And of course the whole point of the experiment 
is that you can't see the polymer. It's invisible. And you can't see any surfactant or anything else you've ever added to the system. It's invisible, too. You can, however, see the probes you've put in. We started with polystyrene spheres. The reason we started with polystyrene spheres is we had them on hand. They're very intensely scattering, so you can easily go down to O, 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 5 by volume. So the spheres are way far apart from each other and don't interact at all. And you are then observing single sphere diffusion coefficient. Uh, the starting point is the Stokes-Einstein equation. This was our starting conceptual point. Because I started off as an assistant professor. Here's the Stokes-Einstein equation. D is the diffusion coefficient of the sphere. Kb is Boltzmann's constant, absolute temperature, 6 pi, viscosity of the liquid, radius of the probe. And my general idea, this is just when I was starting out, is it would make sense to do a set of parametric tests to see if the assumptions that were being put into quasi-elastic light scattering were valid. And so we tried spheres and water as a function of temperature, worked great. We tried uh, we tried looking at spheres and water glycerol as we varied the temperature, and Stokes-Einstein continued to work great. For some pe reason, people were very fond of that experimental system. There are at least three or more papers since then looking at the same system um, with, as so, though, well, in any event, D is proportional to T over eta. We can say that with great certainty. At about that point, uh, one of the, and I just re remembered this very recently, after I wrote the book, in fact, uh, one of the graduate students in the polymer program came through, Allison White. And I described what I was doing, and she suggested, well, why don't you change the viscosity by adding a polymer? And I hadn't even thought of the possibility, but it turned out to be a very good idea. Um, having said that, um, she suggested polyethylene imine, which from the standpoint of synthetic chemists had a, a number of positive features. Uh, that would have turned out to have been a little challenging because polyethylene imine in water would tend to aggregate the spheres we had available at that time. However, I instead tried polyacrylic acid. And the polyacrylic acid, even non-neutralized, has a weak charge and doesn't tend to stick to the polystyrene spheres very much. And we went on from there. Well, there's the Stokes-Einstein equation. You can rewrite it in two forms. And one form, I will put a, an eta over here and rearrange everything else. 6 pi, it's now dr. And eta mu is the micro viscosity. It's the viscosity inferred from the diffusion coefficient of the probes. I could also write this as r h as kt over 6 pi eta d. And RH is an effective hydrodynamic radius. We call it an effective radius because the numbers you get for the radius can be quite different than the size of the particle. And while you could imagine aggregation or something and the particle looks too big, uh, there's no obvious physical process that gives you um, a particle which is actually much smaller than a, a standard atomic scale. Uh, there's an, it's an effective radius, it's not actually the radius of the particle. So we started out and we did measurements. And after not very long at all, it became apparent that if you stuck in the no, known radius of the particle and the known viscosity of the liquid, um, you didn't get agreement with the measured diffusion coefficient. 
the system was not behaving in accord with the Stokes-Einstein equation, and you were getting non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior. Uh, the existence of non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior occasionally upsets people a great deal because it appears to imply that the Stokes-Einstein equation is wrong. Well, that's fairly transparent. And therefore, something is perhaps wrong with Stokes' law. Uh, the actual issue is a bit more complicated than that. First of all, Stokes' law refers to objects moving in a straight line at a constant speed. However, diffusing particles do not move in straight lines, except as a very low probability event. They do not move at constant speed, except as a very low probability event. They move on an irregular course. And if you take an object in water and move it through water on an irregular course, the drag force on the object is not given by Stokes' law. It's given by the Bosonesque equation. Oh, 35 years ago, this became a significant issue briefly in statistical mechanics. And the question was, why do we see the Stokes-Einstein Stokes equation, at least for large objects and low viscosity liquids, when the drag force is not given by Stokes' law, but by this much more complicated equation that has, for example, a memory kernel. And what had to be done was to do the full calculation for objects, and it was simply rederive the Einstein diffusion equation, but put in the correct force law for the moving particles. And if you did this, what you found is that for the specific topic being calculated, to wit, the diffusion coefficient, uh, the Bosonesque Einstein equation, the correct diffusion coefficient, is simply the same as the Stokes-Einstein equation. And you can find nice papers by, oh, let's see, uh, Chow and Kermans, for example. And therefore, well, Stokes' law isn't, Stokes-Einstein really isn't correct, but the correct equation gives the same result. Having said that, if you now have a particle in a viscoelastic liquid, and the, it's moving through the viscoelastic liquid, the drag force uh, due to the viscoelastic liquid is even more complicated than the drag force due to water. And there is no particular reason to suppose that, the Sto that Stokes' law or the Stokes-Einstein equation remain valid. OK, so what do you find? Well, you're measuring the diffusion coefficient. You've got a polymer in the solution. And so one thing you find is that the diffusion coefficient depends on the probe diffusion coefficient, depends on the polymer concentration, and you find an e to the minus alpha c to the nu. You find a stretched exponential concentration dependence. You measure diffusion at a series of concentrations. And if we plot d against c, you see on a linear plot something that looks like that. And that is actually this form. Fortunately, having found this, the period at which we found this was also the period at which microcomputers were available, what were then called microcomputers, personal computers were available. I happened to find a book that discussed nonlinear least squares using the simplex algorithm. And I was able to write software that extracted these parameters in a nonlinear way. And you really have to treat this as a um, problem in nonlinear least squares. Oh, minor aside, there are two completely separate groups of function fitting using the simplex algorithm. Uh, in one of them, you're doing linear fits. So you have very large matrices, for example, and you're trying to extract coefficients. In the other, you're doing functional fits, 
and you're trying to find parameters that lurk inside a nonlinear equation. And you have to realize there are two of them because if you just look up the wrong one, you'll be totally baffled about how you can do the fitting process. So that is nonlinear least squares using the simplex algorithm. Well, so, so we actually were able to do this, and we now advance to the text. We advance to the discussion of looking at large probes. What do I mean by a large probe? Oh, a large probe might have a size of um, 20 or 200 nanometers. We kept looking for smaller probes that were usable in our system. And as I recall, we never got much below about 15 nanometers in a satisfactory way. So you look at the system. And the first thing you actually do is to measure the light scattering spectrum. And so if we plot either the dynamics, the um, spectrum itself, or the dynamic structure factor as a function of delay time, on a, a semi-log or lo, on a semi-log plot, you see something. On a log-log plot, you see something that looks like this. And with available technology, when I started doing this, that was about all you could see. With modern technology covering much wider spectral ranges, you discover there are often, but not always, multiple relaxations. Uh, and we will eventually get to systems that show two or three very distinct relaxations separate in time by an order of magnitude or more, way separated from each other. And you can then talk about the multiple modes. However, what you can also do is to say, we can see the initial relaxation. And the initial relaxation, the early time relaxation, which you can extract from a cumulus analysis of the light scattering spectrum, the earliest part of the relaxation gives us a diffusion coefficient. And for the spectrum, we have e to the minus dq squared t. Word of warning, if you try fitting the spectrum to a single exponential, a pure exponential, you will get out nonsense. What you have to do is to say, we have a relaxation spectrum. We can fit it to a cumulant expansion. And in that case, the first cumulant of the relaxation gives us a diffusion coefficient. Uh, at single, fitting to pure exponentials is extremely disappointing or extremely dangerous because the fitting process is unstable. If you fit to cumulants instead, which are intrinsically convergent, this is discussed in modest detail in chapter 4, you, however, get reasonable results. Now, having said this, you can pull out diffusion coefficients. You should realize that there is a competing approach, which you will sometimes see in the literature. And the competing approach is to claim that G1 is given by, up to constants, e to the minus, and there's a q square, and there's a mean square displacement as a function of time. This equation is correct for diffusing particles in a system that satisfies the Langevin equation. That is, a system in which there is no memory function, no viscoelasticity. Well, if the equation is only correct, uh, we'll get to why it's only correct, in systems that are not viscoelastic, it does not apply to polymer solutions, and it's quite wrong there. How can you tell if this equation is valid? You can tell that the equation is valid because if the equation is correct, d is a constant, 
and the relaxation spectrum is a single exponential in time. This is Doob's theorem. which shows that if you want to have a mean square displacement here, you must have a relaxation process that is a Markov process, a process with no memory. And if the process is a Markov process, it must mathematically be the case that the relaxation is linear in time. The simplest case beyond monodispersed spheres in pure water to it, bidispersed spheres in pure water, if you thought this was correct and plot mean squared displacement versus time for a bidispersed mixture of spheres, why? You get a straight line. And if you plot the spectrum of the bidispersed spheres on the same scale as you plot minus log g here, you get something that is totally wrong by orders of magnitude at long time because the spectrum does not measure the mean square displacement except in the one trivial special case. Okay, let us push ahead and let us push ahead to Turner and Hallett. And what Turner and Hallett did is say we have large spheres and we happen to have dextran which was a very nice polymer to start out with it's neutral, it doesn't tend to stick to the spheres at all, and therefore we can do measurements. And we can measure diffusion versus sphere size versus polymer concentration versus other things, polymer molecular weight. And what do we find? Well, first of all, if we look in with several different size spheres, we see the same behavior. Of course, different sized spheres have different diffusion coefficients in pure water, but you can divide that out. And once you've divided that out, the diffusion coefficient of these spheres in dextran is independent of the size of the spheres. On the other hand, the diffusion coefficient depends quite markedly on the polymer molecular weight. If you take a specific set of spheres, a fixed polymer concentration, and you start increasing the polymer molecular weight, if you increase the molecular weight of the of matrix with the concentration and radius being fixed, the diffusion coefficient falls. Large polymers are more effective at retarding the motion of spheres than are small polymers. Uh, furthermore, they were able to give a functional form, namely, e, this functional form was e to the minus some constant a concentration to the first power. That is, they saw a simple, a simple exponential of concentration to the first, a pure exponential concentration dependence. And they did this um, for a variety of polymer molecular weights and saw these results. They also measured by direct means, Turner and Hallett measured by direct means, the um, viscosity of the system. And what they found was the viscosity they measured uh, with a macroscopic instrument was the same as the viscosity they inferred from the um, diffusion coefficient. Well, if literature stopped here, if this result had been generally true, you would have had a light scattering spectrometer and laser and probes and purification, and you would have had a, an, an incredibly expensive replacement a replacement that would have cost almost a thousand times as much for a simple uh, Cannon Fensky or Ubelota viscometer. If the two viscosities were simply equal, uh, light scattering spectroscopy and optical probe diffusion would have been a very expensive way to do something that you could have ju just as well done for much less money. Okay, so.
what happens? Well, the answer is we can chug ahead to um, the next few papers. And I think credit should be given to my good friend Alex Jameson. And there is a paper by Jameson and collaborators on xanthan. And if you look carefully, you discover in xanthan solutions, they measured the diffusion coefficient of probes, they measure the viscosity, they get a fairly interesting set of results. Uh, on the other hand, you can chug ahead and you can say, let's look carefully at this, or appearing very slightly later, there are papers I did with Taiho Lin, who's now at National Tsinghua University in um, Taiwan. And what we did was to observe diffusion coefficient in polyacrylic acid. Now, the polyacrylic acid we looked at, we made the choice of looking at non-neutralized polyacrylic acid. We didn't have to do that. We could have neutralized it and looked at polyelectrolyte effects. And in retrospect, it's probably lucky that we did what we did because you do go to polyelectrolyte effects, you have many more variables, it's much harder to unsort what's going on, it turns out. And in addition, uh, the experimental methodology of the time, in particular the available digital correlators for doing the light scattering spectrum, were by modern standards a bit limited. Nonetheless, we looked at spheres in 300 kilodalton polyacrylic acid. And if we plotted the apparent hydrodynamic radius, that was our choice of variable, as a function of the polymer concentration, what we found for several sizes of spheres was that RH, the hydrodynamic radius, tended to fall with increasing polymer concentration. Now, the fact that the apparent hydrodynamic radius tended to fall that is, the fact that the microviscosity was less than the macroscopic viscosity, and when we got to very large one megadalton polyacrylic acid, the microviscosity was much less than the macroscopic viscosity. That was a very fortunate turn of events. The reason it was fortunate is that you can think of several artifacts that would appear to cause the Stokes-Einstein equation to fail. For example, you have spheres, and you put them in the polymer solution, and they stick to each other, and they're a big object. Or you have spheres, or you put them in the polymer solution, and the polymer sticks to the spheres at one end, and you now have a furry sphere. These things have something in common. They're too big. Under most conditions, you would expect them to move too slowly. And if they move too slowly, the apparent viscosity, the microviscosity, would appear to be too large. In fact, the observed microviscosity was too small. And therefore, we were able, as a best guess at the time, to rule out the notion that there was aggregation or that there, you were forming furry spheres. Sphere aggregation has since been studied somewhat interestingly and systematically by Paul Russo and collaborators, but we weren't there yet. The other thing we found was that this behavior depended on the polymer molecular weight, so that for 300 kilodalton polymers, the micro, there was, the micro viscosity was a bit small, but the effects weren't incredibly large. And you might argue, well, maybe there's some trace effect you're missing. For one megadalton um, polyacrylic acid in our probes, the, the uh, non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior could be enormous. It could be orders of magnitude 
And there was absolutely no doubt that you, at least with our instruments and our interpretation, were seeing dramatic non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior. On the other hand, if you went in and said, let's look at a really small polymer, we looked at 50 kilodalton polyacrylic acid. And when we looked in at 50 kilodalton polyacrylic acid, what we found to reasonable approximation was that the microviscosity was equal to the uh, macroscopic viscosity. So we actually did the experiments, and having done the experiments, what we found was that there was non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior. It was, could be quite dramatic. And in addition to being quite dramatic, it was molecular weight dependent in a somewhat plausible manner. Now, for better or worse, we also were able to make the point that some of these solutions were extremely viscous indeed. And therefore, by orthodox standards, if you believed in the Duchenne polymer ideas, the polymer solutions were entangled. Uh, if you believed the usual argu Duchenne arguments, um, it seemed as though once you had entangled solutions, what was supposed to matter was the size of the tube, the holes between the polymer chains, not the length of the polymer chains. That is, you have entangled polymers. They're very long. And if you change the polymer mo uh, molecular weight, meaning you go in and insert an occasional random cut in the polymers, you could change the polymer molecular weight by some fair amount. And the hole here doesn't care about this because you haven't done anything locally. Well, that interpretation was, was seemingly rejected by experiment. Uh, you can always put up objections as to why you shouldn't believe the experiment, but that was seemingly the case. We did, however, advance, Lin and I, and I think Tai Ho Lin should get credit for this, did advance a possible interpretation of this, namely that what we were seeing was sheer thinning. Now, we advanced the interpretation, and at least one referee immediately raised the basically reasonable objection, superficially, that the system was not under shear, so why should it being, be being thinned? And the answer is, let's erase this. The answer is, here is a sphere. It's moving this way. And right near its surface, or at some distance out, there is a hydrodynamic flow field of some sort. And the hydrodynamic flow field weakens as you go further and further from the sphere. And therefore, because the diffusing sphere is moving, it's surrounded by a non-linear, non-uniform hydrodynamic flow field. And there is shearing. And therefore, you could, in some sense, see shear thinning. Uh, Lin extended this. And these were experiments he did by himself as a grad student. Uh, he looked at titania spheres. And he looked at titania spheres in a polymer melt. The polymer melt was not very high molecular weight, but it really was a melt. It was a polyethylene oxide melt. And what he did was to measure the diffusion of the spheres, infer a microviscosity, and then realize it's a polymer solution. It's shear thinning. So if I plot the viscosity of the um, measured viscosity versus the shear rate in our instrument, that is, if we have, for example, two parallel plates, and we move one plate faster and faster with respect to the other and ask what force we need, the apparent viscosity of the system falls on an appropriate scale, sort of like that. And if you took this and extrapolated it enough, you could infer the shear rate that corresponded to the diffusion coefficient and the microviscosity of the polysta of the probes, which were titania spheres. And you could infer an effective shear rate. 
that is, you say we see in a microviscosity, and there is some shear rate at which shear thinning would give us that um, sort of thinning of the polymer solution. We asked, what is that shear rate? And the answer he came up with was about something like 10 to the 4 per second. Well, that's a number to about 10 to the 4 per second. And then since we also asked, know the diffusion coefficient, this gives us an inverse time. We know a diffusion coefficient. And there, and from a t and a diffusion coefficient, x squared equals 2d tau, we could infer, he could infer, a displacement, a length scale that corresponds to the shear thinning. And the length scale was extremely small indeed, and therefore, since we've gotten into the molecular region, the um, shear, um, the distance scale was in a rough approximation, but it was something like the thickness of a polymer chain in the melt. That is, the observed, the observed diffusion coefficient, the observed time scale from the shear thinning, uh, corresponds to the time needed for the, the probes to move something like the thickness of a polymer chain and therefore, for one polymer chain here, to have had to skitter to the side, well, first here and then there, out of the way so the sphere could move through. So in a certain sense, this was a microreology experiment, but it was not being done in exactly the same sense that has been done by other people since. It's a very clever experiment. OK, so what else could we do? Well. I don't give you these graphs. I did give you, however, if you look back a bit, figures 9-2 through 9-4 are results on polyacrylic acid in water and probes moving through them. And we will now advance in the book. We will now advance in the book to figure 9-5. And these are large probes. And they're in dextran, which turned out to be a very well-behaved material. Um, we did experiments. You add a little detergent to the spheres. And the idea is, here is a sphere. You add a little Triton X100. Or some other uh, surfactant to the sphere. The surfactant coats the sphere and prevents polymer adhesion. This turned out not to be a big deal in this system. It was a much bigger deal when we studied polyethylene oxide solutions. And we looked at two radius of spheres, 21 and 230 nanometers. And we looked in, ver in dextrans and various molecular weights. And what we found, first of all, was the diffusion coefficient followed the, a universal scaling form, e to the minus alpha c to the nu. The other thing we could do, and you can find this in figure 9-5, is that you can plot alpha or nu against polymer molecular weight. And we had a whole series of values of um, alpha and a whole series of molecular weights. And what we saw was actually a fairly clean straight line. And we and this and nu also showed a fairly clean behavior as a function of M. This uh, I have had people tell me that this this these results were much more convincing than those before then. That we had a fair number of molecular weights the scatter in alpha was quite small. You really did see a straight line. And therefore, you could say alpha was proportional to m to some power, which we were able to infer. OK.
There are a whole bunch of other experiments on the same, on the same sorts of systems. We're still talking about large probes. We're talking about probes that are bigger, even bigger than a whole polymer coil in some cases. And so let's chug ahead and we have, for example, studies of Furukawa and where So are there Furukawa and where? And one can then measure the microscopic viscosity. And she was able to do this as a function of probe size. And so here is the, micro, here is the viscosity. I'm going to label the graph microscopic viscosity. But in fact, there was plotted a measurement of the orthodox macroscopic viscosity. And then there were several sorts of probes, including two molecular weights of polymer and fluorescein, which is a small molecule dye. These experiments were done with FRAP, not quasi-elastic light scattering. And what was found was that as you, as you made the probes smaller, eta mu also fell. There are other experiments, however, that find the opposite result. It's a, it seems to be a little more complicated. OK. So let us push ahead. And what other experiments can we talk about? Well, there are a nice set of experiments from name and again. And the notion is we will do two sets of measurements. We will find, we will measure the probe diffusion coefficient, which is kT over a drag coefficient. And we will measure the sedimentation coefficient, which is also proportional to 1 over f. This is the sedimentation coefficient for a probe in some polymer matrix. And we ask, how are these two related? And the answer is that the diffusion coefficient and the sedimentation coefficient, to reasonable precision, use the same drag coefficient throughout. So that is um, a comparison. Uh, this comparison has an interesting feature that is a little more subtle. <coughs> if you're doing light scattering spectroscopy, you're measuring the motion of particles over a distance scale that is moderately smaller than a light wavelength. You're measuring diffusion over distances that are a fraction of a light wavelength long. If you go to very low angle scattering, you can make that distance scale somewhat larger. For sedimentation, you're measuring objects dropping through a significant part of the length of a an analytical ultracentrifuge cell. You're looking at macroscopic distances. So this is a direct test, as described in the text, that the microscopic diffusion coefficient and the um, sedimentation coefficient, the very long wavelength sedimentation coefficient, are using the same drag coefficient. If you want to see deviations, though, the sensible process for seeing deviations on distance scale is to go to very short distances and measure the dependence of the diffusion coefficient on the scattering angle, because you can then look at very short distances using light scattering. However, what was demonstrated that is very important and positive is that you can use light scattering to do what is basically a long wavelength limit, a large distance limit measurement of the diffusion coefficient. All right. The probes we've talked about so far have mostly been polystyrene latex spheres. Blobs of polystyrene, polystyrene doesn't dissolve in water. So if you make polystyrene blobs, even though they're not cross-linked, in water. You've got to coat them with surfactant or surface modify them so they're charged and stay in solution. 
but they have no tendency to dissolve. They're very stable because the polystyrene can't stand to dissolve in water. An alternative, alternative method of making probes is the Sturber process. And the Sturber process gives us little silica spheres. The silica spheres turn out to be extremely monodisperse. They're um, very well behaved. You can surface modify them by attaching polymer, very short polymer. And the silica spheres, unlike non-cross-linked polystyrene spheres, are stable in organic solvents. Well, that's very positive. And we come to figure. 9-9A, and 9-9A gives us the diffusion of some of these silica spheres in solutions of polymethyl EMMA. There is our polymer. And we can plot the diffusion coefficient as a function of concentration and as a function of molecular weight. And once again, as we increase the molecular weight of the polymer, it becomes more effective at retarding the motion of the spheres. Okay. Additional measurements of this sort are found in nine dash, figure 9-10, which is measurements of Onyana Mizu and collaborators. And these are, again, measurements of diffusion of spheres. These have been cross-linked because we're looking at spheres in polystyrene and in uh, dimethyl formamid. Polystyrene and NN dimethyl formamid, which increase the concentration of the polymer. We measure the diffusion coefficient that falls. The authors very sensibly also measured the viscosity of the liquid and what they found if they plotted d eta over eta zero, that is. D is reduced as the viscosity is increased. We multiply by the fractional increase in the viscosity. Stokes-Einstein behavior is that. And that's not what they found. They found something that looks like a mild or a more dramatic increase. Maybe not quite that dramatic. You can see the figure in the book. Uh, a core issue here is they were looking at uh, probes in an orthodox polymer, polystyrene, in a fairly standard organic solvent. And so any suggestion that the non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior was some complicated issue because you were doing water-soluble polymers, you were doing charged probes, you were uh, in an aqueous system with all sorts of possible complications. Well, all of those issues are removed by this experiment. Um, silica spheres are very rigid. The opposite direction is due to work of Kao and collaborators and Rama Bonsal. And they looked at silica spheres and they also looked at Vesicles. Now, what is a vesicle? Well, a vesicle is a bubble underwater. The surface of the bubble is made of a material that is charged at one, the molecules are charged at one end, neutral on the other. It's a surfactant. But the other feature is that it will form, for example, a lipid bilayer. There are bunches of more complicated options. And so you have this bubble of oil. And it really is a bubble. The inside is water. They also did multilamellar vesicles. In a multilamellar vesicle, these things are packed one inside each other like an onion. And what they found was that the polymer solution they looked at was more effective at retarding the motion of a rigid body 
than at retarding the motion of a non-rigid sphere. That is, they found an effect that could be correlated with the fact that the system was flexible. Okay. And that is it for simple measurements on large probes. The reason I say that's it for simple measurements is that with more modern technology using quasi-elastic light scattering, you can readily measure the detailed shape of the light scattering spectrum. And if you do that, you can, using methods that are likely to give reasonable answers, actually break the light scattering spectrum into different modes. Okay, so we're going to break the spectrum into different modes, and we are going to ask what sorts of things happen. Well, there are nice experiments. We'll start now, next section, small probes. And if we are looking at small probes, can we find interesting results? What sort of small probes are there? Well, we've talked about fluorescein before. That's an organic molecule, not a very large one. Uh, you can talk about proteins. Proteins are globular particles. Uh, the difficulty with studying proteins is they don't scatter vastly more light than the polymer does, and therefore quasi-elastic light scattering turns out not to be an ideal way to do the measurements. Other methods are better. Um, you can also talk about, these were in materials a bit ago, starburst dendromers. And what is a starburst dendromer? Well, you have a starting point, and you have something short that comes out with it. I'm skipping the details of the chemistry. <coughs> And then there's a branch point, and the synthesis of the branch point is such that you have typically pairs coming out from the branch. But you've controlled the chemistry so that at each step, the things coming out from the branch are all the same length. And these, if you do the math, you discover that uh, the number of links expands faster than the square of the radius. And eventually, you start running into issues. However, the core issue here is it makes very nice, very small spheres. OK, so you do these measurements. And you then ask, what do you find? Well, I will only give one example, because we're a teeny bit short of time. I talk about Boo and Rousseau. We talk in the book about nice measurements by Cheng et al. I am going to look very carefully, or not very carefully, but very briefly at measurements by Bush and collaborators. And they measured the diffusion of something known as green fluorescent protein. And they looked at the material diffusing variously through Kickel. 70, and also through a DNA. And what I have plotted first is DP times eta. So we have a short DNA, very cl clearly controlled molecular weight, linear molecule. Fickles are more lumpy. And what happens when we do the experiment? Well, what we find is non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior for these small materials, and different degrees of non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior depending on the matrix. Um, G. Different protein measurement. This is work that I did myself. And the work I did myself, we will plot the fluidity, the inverse of the viscosity, and we are looking at polyethylene oxide solutions. 
And in addition to looking at the polyethylene oxide solutions, we are going to put into them bovine serum albumin using the bovine serum albumin as the probe. And what we found was that the bovine, there was a diffusion, there was the fluidity of the material, there was the um, ability of the um, probes to move, and the polyethylene oxide was more effective at reducing the fluidity, that is more effective at increasing the viscosity, than it was at reducing the diffusion coefficient. So we tried the experiments and it actually worked. Okay, last set of experiments due to Ullman, Greg Ullman, and several other people. This was all done in my lab. And the experiments were probes in polyethylene oxide. And what we did in this case is we were able to demonstrate that under some conditions the polymer would stick to the probes. And at first we didn't, we weren't, we sort of wandered into this sideways, that is we didn't realize it was going to be an issue, but the dependence of the diffusion coefficient on polymer concentration was a bit odd. And so what we did to deal with this is we took the probes and we put into the solution a surfactant, and the surfactant we found was workable, as I recall, it was Triton X100. And this is a neutral material, and the, what the surfactant does is that it sticks to the surface of the probe. And it sticks to the surface of the probe sufficiently firmly that the polymer can't get in to attach. Now the way you demonstrate this has happened is that you look at the diffusion of coefficient of the probe as a function of, tri of, of surfactant concentration, and what you discover is that once you've put in enough surfactant, the diffusion coefficient saturates at some value. It saturates if you go through all the numbers as though the spheres are a bit larger than they were before, but only a bit larger. And if you add more, if you change the polymer concentration a bit, you, if you look at higher or lower polymer concentration, you can still demonstrate that out here someplace the diffusion coefficient is independent of the surfactant concentration. And this leads directly to the conclusion that you've sur successfully surface coated the spheres with the detergent and the polymer is off in the solution. Well, having done that, we could then do two sets of measurements. And the first set of measurements was to measure D, or equivalently, the microviscosity A to mu, well, it's really 1 over A to mu, as a function of the polymer concentration for several different sizes of spheres. And you got out curves that showed that as you added polymer, the diffusion coefficient went down, the microviscosity went up. Well, that's very nice. Now let's compare with the measurements we already have of the diffusion coefficient of the spheres in which there's no added Triton X100. These spheres are changing size. They're changing size because there's polymer sticking to them. However, at the same time they're changing size, the microviscosity is changing. The growth of the sphere can be described by an adsorption isotherm and it has a fairly nice form. The microviscosity can be described by, G. we just measured it. And so we've used spheres of known size to de determine how the microviscosity depends on polymer concentration. You have to be a little careful because the microviscosity cares about the sphere size. So we did the measurement for a series of spheres of different radius, finding that 
the dependence of the microviscosity on polymer concentration does change slowly with sphere size. But if we use a sphere of about the right size to measure eta mu, we should get about the right answer for the microviscosity. And therefore, from D and the microviscosity, you could determine a binding isotherm. Alternatively, you could say, we have the binding isotherm, we can determine the thickness of the bound material and how it goes down and grows in. And we could calculate the diffusion coefficient based on the statement, number one, we're getting binding with an isotherm, number two, we're getting non-Stokes-Einsteinian behavior, and you get some fairly complicated curves, and the fairly complicated curves are described entirely accurately by this model. That is, we could show, yes, you can see uh, polymer adhering to the spheres. And when you do, if you are clever in your experiments, you can actually determine the, thick, the effective hydrodynamic thickness of the binding layer. Now, I'm going to emphasize, I just said, effective and hydrodynamic, because you don't know if you've got a big, thick, solid layer of polymer or if you have a sphere with a few chains and it's just enough tails sticking out a fair distance so the sphere looks large, you can't actually distinguish between these two with the experiments we did. Okay, what I have done today is to introduce optical probe diffusion as an experimental technique. We've talked about the diffusion of large probes in polymers. We've talked about the diffusion of small probes in polymer solution. The major points we made were, well, number one, D falls off with increasing concentration. Number two, it often, but not always, this was a not always, does not depend strongly on the radius of the probes. Uh, number three, if you say we're measuring D, we can infer a microviscosity the microviscosity in the cases discussed here is always less than the macroscopic viscosity. The probes are advancing faster than you would have thought from the viscosity of the liquid. Uh, we can also look at such things as the flexibility of the probe. Flexible probes, based on limited data, move further. We can look at very small probes. That's been done. So we've now had our introduction to optical probe diffusion. That's it. Class dismissed.